This is Defenders TV Podcast, episode 159, where we're talking to you about Luke Cage, season 2, episode 3, Wig Out. Wig out, everybody. It is Defenders TV podcast episode 159, where we're talking to you about Luke Cage, season 2, episode 3, a.k.a. Wig out, because I just like saying a.k.a. I am one of your hosts, Chris Jones, joined today by my fellow Defenders in Arms. Yeah, I'm one of the other hosts, Derek. Yes, and I am the third and final host, John. Uh, Good to have you on board, fellow Defenders. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, thank you so much, guys. Guys, we are here. It is episode three. Mm-hmm. We're three, three hours deep into a 13-hour Luke Cage marathon. Well, when I say marathon, it just means endurance test, much like Luke sprinting in episode two. <laughs> yes, we don't sprint on Defenders TV Podcast. We don't watch ahead. We, uh, we generally watch the episodes and record our podcasts. So uh, you'll be getting two episodes a week from now on, on Tuesdays and Fridays every week. This is our first episode being recorded after the show has gone live to everybody around the world on Netflix. So been really interesting hearing some of the feedback from uh, some of the watchers and uh, some of the fans of Luke Cage seem to be very uh, happy with the series so far. Trying to avoid spoilers uh, as we are. Uh, trying not to read uh, reviews that have spoilers in them. But it's great seeing the overall positive reaction um, to people from this series. Yes, and fellow offenders, remember, no matter how much good we put out into the world, there will always be... The evil Thanos led dark side. So if you do see anyone complaining, say what? Just be like Bu- Luke Cage. Be bulletproof. Let it just bounce off you because there is no point getting into the dark side on this because we are here in Defender Sea Pass. We dive deep into every episode of the Netflix universe shows. And do you know what? They're so good. We have bullet points upon bullet points upon but just bullets really and points. <laughs> So today we're going to be looking at episode three. And do you know what? If you want to know more about our show, if you want to know about all our previous work, you can get access to everything we've ever done over at the website at DefendersTVPodcast.com. And that will also tell you where you can follow us, where you can join in the conversations, where you can even give feedback. Because do you know what? We want to hear from you. Mm -hmm. But before, well, actually, no, not even before we jump into our bullet points. Let's actually celebrate the writers and directors of this episode as we do every episode but it just makes it sound more important because i'm talking right now (laughs) derek can you give us the deets absolutely this episode was written by matt owens i love this writer he's done eight episodes of agents of shield my favorite marvel show Oh yeah he's your favorite Mm -hmm. absolutely love him absolutely love him he also wrote episode three of the first series of luke cage so he has worked with luke before and all of the cast so uh, yeah he's got a really good handle on these characters really enjoy his writing for the show and this episode was directed by mark jobs the first male director for season two of uh, luke cage I didn't mention this in the last couple of episodes but one of the things they talked about in interviews coming up to the launch of luke cage was that uh, they felt there was actually something missing from season one of luke cage by not having any female directors on board so about half of the episodes have been directed by female directors and um, we had lucy luke for episode one and we had steph on episode two both female directors and now coming back to mark jobs he has worked uh, in this world of, of marvel netflix we've talked about him a couple of times before because he's done episodes of daredevil punisher and season one of luke cage so uh, nice to have his eye in for this episode which is quite an important episode for the characters of the show i think uh, so good to have a director that's worked with all of the cast before and you can kind of see how his style is used in this episode as well he definitely knows the world really well the last piece of coverage we did was jessica jones season two and they came out officially and every director for season two was female and i've actually been thinking more and more about this and i actually really am proud of what the this universe or these the series the universe if you know what i mean the netflix guys is by introducing diversity but not by div- diversity sake yes what they're doing really is showing that by having this 50 50 60 40 split we're getting that to the right director for the right episode exactly. and they're getting we're getting that great spectrum of the different point of views the different styles mm-hmm. but enough of my flapping john do you want to tell us what they gave us in the synopsis 
Sure. In the aftermath of Luke Cage's intervention to save CJ and his mom from Cockroach, Luke's brutality and single-mindedness is challenged by both Claire Temple and Misty Knight. As Luke feels castrated and talked at, he continues to pursue his leads in his fight against Mariah and Shades. In the Yardie's backyard, he encounters a new boss, Bushmaster, at the head of the Brooklyn Jamaican gang, and seemingly stamps his authority over his new threat to Harlem. Elsewhere, Mariah continues to heal the rift with her daughter, Tilda, with the launch of her Family First program in Harlem. At the same time, she launches her move to riches and legitimacy with the Atreus Plastics deal. Misty, still feeling pressure at the precinct, connects with Colleen Wing at the dojo and over a drink, regaining her swagger with a fine left hook as she defends herself against a violent group in the bar intent on revenge. Cockroach's beating and hospitalization strains Claire and Luke's relationship to breaking point. An argument between them both exposes fundamental differences and Claire asks Luke to leave her apartment. With Luke reeling from his fight with Claire, he is left reeling again, this time from a punch, as Bushmaster delivers a message straight to the heart of Harlem and his yard. So much great stuff in this episode. Really, really couldn't take my eyes off the screen for a lot of this of this story. There's just some fantastic moments. And as you mentioned, Chris, one of the most emotional moments I think we've seen uh, so far in, in all of the Netflix shows, led by Mike Coulter and Rosario Dawson, two of the most experienced actors in the uh, Netflix universe because they've appeared in so many shows over time. And it really shows these two actors and how great they are uh, in this episode. But we're not going to start off there. I have one thing I want to continue, which is... We've been talking about how I've been. I was came in spoiler free, mm-hmm. so I, I particularly didn't watch any of the. I muted Netflix on social media. Just <laughs> muted, didn't unfollow. I muted just for the lead up. Yeah, and the scene with Misty and Colleen, which we'll discuss later, mm-hmm. was one of the trailer teaser points. That's right. That was released. I'm so glad because I went in fresh and I was like, "This is amazing," mm-hmm. and it was only later. Now that I'm, I'm kind of slowly going back through some of the stuff, and I, I saw people talking about going, oh, I've seen that scene already. I'm like, I'm so glad. Actually, I went in fresh because I don't advocate always going in spoiler free, mm-hmm. but it's actually quite a change. Yeah, like yeah. I, I, I think it had a different um, effect on me for this se- season so far. Good. Um, so really, really good. Good stuff. I will, I will say, I obviously have watched all of the trailers, and I don't think it took anything away, uh, knowing that that scene was coming up. It's kind of cool. You kind of knew that those two characters were working together and were friends, so seeing them together and how it played out in the episode worked much better than just having the, the fight scene stand alone as it was. It was just a nice tease for the season, but uh, I definitely think it works better in the show itself. Um, John, do you want to kick in with the bullet point? Yeah, the our one? first bullet point Um do I have to do your job for you? This is the aftermath of uh, Luke saving CJ and his mum from the domestic violence and abuse that Cockroach is doing to them. Mm. But in a sense, losing control. And, um, you know, he's fresh off the back of a disagreement and argument with, with Claire here from the previous episode. You know, they, they've had, um, a gradual strain build up over, um, how how Luke is kind of seeing himself as a hero and kind of his trajectory here. And here he goes full out brutal. It's like he forgets his own strength uh, against Cockroach yes. and really um, takes him to the cleaners. And of course, whilst for a normal uh, fellow superhero or supervillain, if they were at the end of those punches by Luke and um, Cockroach, no matter how um, abhorrent what he's doing is also human and maybe cannot deal with um, those, those punches and those smackdowns from, from, from Luke. And uh, this is really good because it ultimately ends up with Claire and Misty both coming to CJ's uh, apartment here. You've got Cockroach absolutely knocked out, few broken ribs, possibly concussion. Uh, but I think, you know, it's this single-mindedness uh, of, of Luke Cage in, in the pursuit of, of these gangs in Harlem and his doggedness in protecting Harlem. But, it's really becoming self-obsessed and yeah. self-righteous. He really is um, battling against everyone uh, 
as well as himself in, in what he's wanting to do here. And I, I thought uh, this was a really interesting treatment of Luke Cage. For me, Luke Cage has been a moral center, you know, especially in Defenders with the other members of, of that group. You know, he was the one that didn't want to bring down the, the skyscraper. He didn't want to use the explosives. He doesn't want to kill people. Mm-hmm. And... He has this real sense of morality about him, and he did in season one as well, you know, guided by Pops, as well as Claire Temple. But increasingly, whether it's frustration or whatever, he's moving in a different way. He's moving down a different path. And uh, what I really liked here is that, you know, Misty really does give him a slice of humble pie or so he should but i don't think he takes it on board when you see the rest of the episodes you know she's there going it doesn't look good claire has said the same thing he's there going i do the right thing and my freedom is at risk if you were doing your job properly Mm. i wouldn't have to do it for you and misty just retorts to him to say you know don't talk about um self-sacrifice you know she's lost an arm here she is absolutely under pressure in her job because of her trying to defend luke cage he doesn't seem to appreciate the lengths that she's going to to actually keep him from going back to seagate prison and you know at the end of the day she comes back it's this whole idea of you know vigilantism and then the the police and detectives she goes but you may have cost me my best chance at getting shades of mariah whilst doing my job yeah and i really like this treatment of, of luke cage i like that they've taken him down a a darker route really and seeing him um battle with trying to maintain that legitimacy and um sort of approachability that he had in season one whilst ultimately trying to fight people with no morals it's like he has had to you know to fight his enemy he's had to bring about that and use their techniques and in so doing um you know the people closest to him in claire and misty are seeing a change in how he is going about it yeah and i i thought this was um a really nice angle on luke cage being this protector of Harlem uh, and that he's not above the law. He's not above being brutal uh, and pretty violent. Ultimately, no matter how much cockroach possibly deserved that, you know, at the end of the day, Luke Cage would probably reflect on that and go, that's not what I should have done. Well, you'd hope he would. Yeah. And this is kind of the problem that we have in the episode. Claire points out to him, she's seen him hit someone with a slap across the head and knock them out. He punched this guy into the floor um, and only stopped himself from killing him when he realized there was somebody else in the room, when he came back to his senses. Yet he's here justifying it to Misty and to Claire. You you hit on the right description of it. Self-righteous is what we've got here from Luke Cage. He absolutely believes or is trying to sell to other people that he believes what he's doing is right. And what Misty points out to him is, how can I do my job if you're getting there before me and punching in the leads that I have? Like, there's, he's not trying to do their job for them. He's not even giving them an opportunity to do their job so that he can then fix the problem. He's he's just jumping in willy-nilly out of nowhere, beating people up around the city without even consulting them. If he had Misty on the other end of the phone, like uh, like his guide, like he t- talked about in the first episode, if he had her in the background telling him and guiding him and uh, allowing him to work together with the police, then maybe he'd have a right to say what he's saying here. But he's giving no opportunity to them at all. So um, it's a tough, tough position to have your central character, Luke Cage, in the show being, I suppose... Uh, difficult to like in these scenes um it's kind of a great decision for them to do it because you should be following his side of things and he's the hero of the show and everybody should be on his side but i found myself increasingly throughout this episode particularly with his argument with misty and and claire i found myself being on their side much more so than on his side it's a great decision of the of the writers of the show to move them that way yeah me too the sympathy you have for luke cage you know rapidly evaporated for me in 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 this episode Mm -hmm. um you know you can empathize or you can understand him battling with what's happened to him what he's become how he has to try and balance that but then when the people that you know he's worked as a team with claire and, and with misty um suddenly are telling him what's happening to you and he 
has no time for them. He has no time for what they're saying and, and sees them as being a threat, that somehow they are now becoming part of the problem. And, and that's a really interesting uh, direction, I think, to take Luke Cage in. Even just the fact that, you know, when Misty turns up, he goes, you need to keep this quiet. So it's really interesting. You have our hero of Harlem asking the police to cover up exactly what he's done, yeah. uh, which is stuff that he was fighting against in terms of um, police cover-up or um, police being corrupt in the first seasons. So you have this whole circle happening, and it's a really interesting take. And whereas Misty has been involving him with the cases uh, that link to Mariah and Shades, all of a sudden Luke is 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 not using her is not working as a team and and there is this fracture between misty uh, and luke as sort of an investigative team uh where you know informally where he's almost like a, an informer to her and then also with claire and and with luke in terms of that partnership in mm-hmm. what luke does in harlem so yeah. i i thought this was really really strong absolutely yeah no look i i i loved where they're taking this which is what can bring down the indestructible man, the bulletproof man, now that he's even more indestructible, even more bulletproof? Mm. You start taking away his support structure. So in Defenders and in Luke Cage Season 1, we see, and even Jessica Jones, we see a support structure being built up. We see Luke Cage, a.k.a. Carl Lucas, come from being the undercut, undercast teenager to becoming the hero of heart. Yeah. So he has risen the ranks. What happens when the hero, the king, becomes the tyrant? Mm-hmm. And that's just like basically, okay, well, we, you, he stops listening to his closest advisors. And it's the crazy part is the predictable way to do this is to start having some little um, shades, Mariah kind of songbird, if you will, kind of turning the characters against an, yes. inf- an infiltrator turning the character against Luke or vice versa. And then big surprise, big reveal at the end. Oh my God, that person was actually working for the bad guys all along. Mm-hmm. No, what they flipped it on his head is actually, no, the, the character, if you stay a hero long enough, you can become a villain. Yes. Yeah. And that's that kind of, what's the adage? Yeah, it's the Dark Knight. Yeah, it's where Harvey Dent says you either die a hero or you stay alive long enough to become the villain because ultimately, um, in the end, it is that pressure from within. I, I think that's a really good point what you're saying, Chris, actually, is that it's it's the self-inflicted pressure that Luke is putting on himself um, to to capture and to make Harlem safe. We've had these metaphors of, you know, punching the, the the water and mm-hmm. um, that you know these this drug being named after him and you know this absolute obsession with seeing mariah and shades get away scot-free at the end of season one and that has kind of you know leaked into his purposefulness and and focus as to what he wants to achieve in harlem so it becomes more obsessive than um, objective and ultimately that eats it up and any criticism of that then he's that's just adding to the frustration and he's projecting that back onto the people ultimately that he is trying to protect and those people that care for him an awful lot Mm -hmm. and remember as well there's also that pressure in the background of the Hero of Harlem app that's going around where everybody in the city is following Luke Cage to see what crime he's going to stop. He has this pressure on him now to be a hero of Harlem at all times because he's being watched. So this idea that he talks to Misty and says, cover this up, because effectively that would affect his fame. If this if this gets found out that he went into somebody's house, broke down the door and beat the crap out of someone on the floor, that would affect his fame because yeah. he lost control. So uh, very important to kind of, they are reiterating that, but not as, I suppose, not as plainly as I just did there, but they're reiterating that in the show that the other pressure that's on him is the fame. And it's that he's oblivious to what the other people are doing to help him. You know, this, this idea that Misty 
actually is putting her job on the line. Mm-hmm. You know, her her captain uh, really would get rid of her. But he's saying the only reason you're still here is because you've become the NYPD's private Ryan. You know, you effectively elect an assault perpetrator, leave the scene of the crime. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Luke either is oblivious to this or um, he's just not even considering that this is helping on what jeopardy that's putting Misty in with regards to um, her own career and her job. Uh, And I think that's really important. And when he, you know, he tackles Claire saying you called the police and she goes, well, no, actually I called Misty and an ambulance for, for cockroach and for CJ and his mom. And in the end, it was the people who, witnessed what luke did to cockroach that called the police exactly and yeah. and you know he he's kind of selecting the truth that fits how he's feeling in going back to these people who are now challenging him and he feels that he's above that um, so it's a, i think it's it's really complex really good mm-hmm. yeah I, I want to finish off this bullet point, just a quick basically an easter egg from the first two episodes and it took me a, unfortunately i apologize for not getting this sooner. Um, it was actually brought up to me on social media. Um, the shotgun that uh, Cockroach uses in episode two. Um, actually, that is from his introduction in the 1975 Paraman comic, Paraman 20, issue 28, um, where he was introduced. He was more of a crime boss in there. Now he's like mid level. Mm-hmm. He's not, he's trying to be a crime boss. He's coming, trying to rise the ranks. But he's not. But the shotgun he uses, the the six barrel shotgun, is um, from that comic, and it's actually just like in the pages. Very cool. Like it's almost scene for scene. Yeah. Very very cool. Well yeah. done to the guys for pulling that. Absolutely. Six um, barrel shotgun is something difficult to pull off, so uh, it looked really cool. Was it? <laughs> yes. So moving on to bullet point number two. Mm-hmm. Let's go back to Mariah Dillard. Yeah. Yeah. Drumming up support for her family first initiative. That is being bankrolled by the owner of Atreus Plastics and obviously is part of her wider plan both to kind of um, blackmail him uh, for for money and for a piece of his company so that she can uh, ultimately gain her fortune as well as her freedom from uh, the life of crime, but also as a way of connecting back in with her daughter, her estranged daughter, Tilda Dillard, uh, who effectively is helping her to rehabilitate her political career as a councilwoman. Yeah. Because even though she's still a councilwoman, you know, there was a lot of shade um, projected onto her uh, from the media at the end of season one because of her connections there. She managed to survive that, but she is now trying to rehabilitate this. Uh, the other great thing um, I was really pleased to see here was her assistant, Alex, back uh, by her side. I really like this guy from season one, how he started off just as her advisor in her political career in Harlem. And then gradually he got as dirty as she did doing certain things to either cover um, up her her criminality, to protect her name, to um, sort of advance her her false claims of being pure uh, i really liked how this character changed in season one yeah i think by the end of the season i think we were calling him her henchman that he was yeah, really basically. had become this henchman to the supervillain by the end of the series and it was it was weird when we saw the first two episodes of the show i think i mentioned outside of the podcast that it was weird not to have him around because he was so important by the end of the season so nice to have him come in when she's actually doing something on her political career that's why he wasn't around we didn't even mention in the first two episodes yeah. that she is still a Pencil woman, but she's also now running this criminal business, and that's part of the reason why she wants to be clean and get away from it because she wants to go back into the powerful political career that she was in before. That's the reason why she wants to be clean, free, and clear. She doesn't want to be a criminal boss. She's kind of fallen into that a little bit. It was that conversation in episode one where um, an advisor is telling her to reconnect with her her daughter Tilda, and after the podcast, it was like, shouldn't that have been Alex? You know, mm. that was her advisor and um, her political strategist and, and uh i'm glad he's back actually yeah. um yeah. i really enjoyed his kind of arc in season one uh, and i really hope they they focus 
on him as as well in, in this season. Yeah, it's just one of the things about the family first fundraiser event that's going on. It, it seemed a little bit confusing because she's basically calling out to everybody in the audience, have your checkbooks ready, we need you to pay for this. And then she kind of forces the head of Atreus Plastics to be the sole sponsor. She effectively tells Tilda as she arrives that he is the sole sponsor. He's the one that's going to pay for all this. So not only is he going to lose his company or controlling interest in his company, he now also has to support her project of Family First, which is quite interesting. It's like as if she's used all of her power while blackmailing him to take everything out from underneath him. It's kind of it's a really powerful move and a really cool move for Mariah to do, even though there seems to be lots of support for what she's doing within that room in the fundraiser. It just is quite interesting that she effectively just pushes it on him and says, hey, it doesn't really matter what that fundraiser is about. You're paying for it. So. <laughs> well, pretty much. If you have a wandering hand and an eye, you're going to get caught. Mm-hmm. Just just note to all wandering eyes and hands. Absolutely. Don't do not do it beside Mariah Dillard or Stokes, depending on who you want to ask. <laughs> and we we do see here that she has been forcing this. She was she had, has him completely set up with Stephanie, who was the waitress that she hired in episode one and was telling her how to uh, work on these people. She set him up completely um, to be blackmailed and i love that he has that moment where he speaks about his wife and he goes she can't see these pictures and uh mariah goes yeah i know exactly what she would do to you if she sees these pictures that's why you're going to do exactly what i say <laughs> it's a great little moment oh yeah but it was even the video mm-hmm. yeah, there's a video yeah. and it wasn't well, it's <laughs> yeah. a great way mariah put it it's like not safe for tv video or uh, she basically said like it's almost there's an x-rated version yeah like and it's, it's not just the tnz splash page yes I really enjoyed this, but I, I, I'm trying to figure out the, the Mariah Tilda situation. Mm-hmm. So we, we get the sense that she's basically using her daughter for this initiative, for this part. Yeah. So that where she calls out her daughters, mm-hmm. tells the story, calls out her daughter midpoint in speech. But then we're getting all these conflicting Kind of that she does want to have a relationship with her daughter, like when they're at the, the when she's at um, Cottonmouth's piano, when they're having dinner, mm-hmm. um, where she calls, I'm having dinner with my family to Shades, and Shades like, I thought I was family, mm-hmm. which, whoo, harsh. That was pretty bad. Yeah. Like, she's really like, oh, I, I don't need Shades anymore because I've got this, my daughter. I, I, the, I can't resolve this part in my head. Is she using her daughter Mm -hmm. for the political gain for the bit, which, because she didn't care, we didn't even know she had a daughter up to this point. Yeah. Uh, Or is it she was and now she's remembered what, how great it was to have a daughter and she's going to do everything for the daughter and it's going to massive rip. I, I don't know. And I think. They need to explain that quickly at one point in the next couple of episodes, which is either I'm using her, I only care about you, or I obviously shades, or it's kind of, I don't know. It's just, it's a, the duality I find really distressing from a story narrative part. I definitely think it's an evolving relationship. Right. I think, um, I think absolutely, you know, her first thought was, I need to project this family image, probably for the family first. The advisor goes, you have a daughter, maybe the rehabilitation of of that. So even if she objectively doesn't want to reconnect with Tilda, she's trying to sell that to Tilda so that you get the genuineness on the political stage Mm -hmm. when she's saying, we've had, you know, our road to Damascus moment and we had a lot of problems and now uh, we see the light and we are, you know, reconnecting again. You know, she does talk about family being complex um, at at that uh, fundraiser. At the same time, I think why she keeps Shades separate was because, um, you know, she is wanting to connect just with her. And, okay, I know what you mean, Chris, about her saying, uh, I'm trying to deal with my family here. And he's saying, well, I'm family. I mean, I think 
he still is. I don't think Shades and her um, are, are necessarily going to split up. I mean, because you see them with the money after the deal uh, for the fundraiser and the blackmail of the guy who heads the Trace Plastics. You see them with the money. And actually, Tilda is looking back at that moment, seeing the two of them embracing. You get that m- fantastic little capture on the camera of the king and queen with their crowns yeah. up against the painting. And I wonder if that's the reality of Mariah and that she is just selling what she wants to Tilda. Yeah, However, yeah. I think one of my favorite bits of this episode as well was Tilda and Mariah sort of reminiscing about when she was younger, saying how I remember sitting here, uh, you know, with the collard greens, with Aunt Mabel, telling people off, um, Cornell playing the music. Um, but then she talks about the bloody towels in the trash can and, you know, people speaking in hushed tones. And, you know, th- there's this idea of the dark corners of the Stokes family and that they're both trying to push through that. So I wonder if there's an element of an innocent here who maybe has a bit of Stokes in her where Mariah's saying those hands are pure Stokes as she's playing the piano, that we see this kind of fall of someone who's trying to distance herself from that darkness. Yeah but kind of gets brought into it. I think at the moment it's evolving. I think, we're yeah, in the next two or three episodes, as you say, Chris, if uh, that it, it kind of gets sort of gradually brought out into the light, the true motives of Mariah mm-hmm. and maybe even Tilda. Uh, who knows? It would be really interesting. I love the fact that after Tilda mentions the hushed tones that she used to remember as a child, that's when shades arise yeah, and then exactly. they go into the yeah. corridor and have a hushed tones conversation. Uh, what I do think is quite funny, though, I'm wondering whether Mariah is actually just saying, don't come round to my house like that, shades, because it's scary as hell when we look up from the table and you're standing there staring at us. <laughs> it's like, that's really creepy, shades. Don't come round to my house like that again. <laughs> I think that's what she's saying. Uh, but this is the thing I love about Mariah's character. She is supposed to be like this. We're, we're not going to get it plainly laid out for us what her plan was in future. I think it is supposed to be duplicitous right now. We're supposed to believe that she is trying to work her way back into the life of Tilda. I'm not even sure whether the friend's first initiative that she's talking about wasn't just done for Tilda's benefit, because it seems like exactly what Tilda would want her mother to do is to set up this thing that talks about family and how important it is to show that she's changed Tilda. By the end of it, as I said earlier on, by the end of it, she's gotten one person blackmailed into sponsoring the whole thing. So she didn't even need to do the, the whole presentation of the fundraiser. She just, just could have gone to him and gone, give me the money because I've got I've got you blackmailed. It feels like this whole thing was set up to t- say to Tilda, look how much I've changed. Look how wonderful I'm going to be to the community of Ireland. So, um, so yeah, I think she's just duplicitous and we may see the full details coming out over, over time or we may not. It may not be plainly laid out for us. This could be just something that we'll see playing out in the back of Mariah's head. Yeah, I, I just want to quickly point into the bit that uh, John said about uh, Tilda may have a bit of Stokes in her, mm-hmm. because what we do, we get Bushmaster earlier in, very earlier in the episode, talking about his little songbird in the camp, mm-hmm. and we find out at the end it is obviously Billy, and we can get onto that point later. I was sure in my head <laughs> at that point it was Tilda. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I was like, I know that's what they wanted you to think, and I'm like. Oh my god, that will be fantastic. At the end of this, if we get a brand new Black Mariah, Mm -hmm. like in the the form of Tilda being completely corrupted (laughs) with shades by her side. Right. That wow. will be fantastic. I don't think that's I don't think that's the way they're gonna go. Um I think obviously the, the moment when we had Bushmaster and Tilda meet for the first time when he comes around to the shop to buy his stuff, she seemed pretty terrified of what he was buying and what he was gonna do yeah. with it. So I think that was there so that you didn't think. But yes, as you say, when he mentions your little songbird and you see her playing the piano, you do put two and two together. Right? Yeah. I know what you mean. Um, but it is, it's also quite interesting that a character that had a two minute scene in episode one with Mariah happens to be their plant in there, the cousin of, yes. uh, of mm. the Yardy gang. So that's quite a cool idea where you definitely now have to pay attention to every background actor in every episode from now on, because you never know what's going to happen to them three episodes down the line or four episodes down the line. Exactly. Gents, I think it's time we can move on to bullet point number three. Oh, yes. We have this down as just Misty and Colleen, but screw it. Let's just call it for what it is. The Daughters of the Dragon. This was the pilot. Yes. 
<laughs> and I am 100% okay with that. This was just fantastic. It's one of those things that just makes sense for the crossover, doesn't it? Yes. It was, I wasn't really expecting a new Colin Wing was going to be in the show. I just wasn't expecting her to come in this early in the show. But it makes so much logical sense that Misty would still be in contact with her and calls her up when she needs to take out some frustration and talk to somebody outside of her day-to-day situation. Colleen's absolutely the right person. And I love how Colleen Wing treats Misty. I love that she's not yeah. going to pander to her self-pity. That's the kind of idea. She's kind of going, why would you be self-pitying? You're a hero. You stood in the way to block me so that I didn't lose an arm. I have so much respect for you. I think that's just a beautifully played scene with Colleen. I love that they have this kind of relationship where they're able to talk to each other. They do mention that Danny's been trying to call Misty uh, for the last couple of weeks, but she's not been answering. So uh, he is still a friend as well. But I like that it's Colleen and Misty alone in these scenes dealing through something quite difficult for Misty to deal with. Colleen references the fact that she effectively was in a cult for years. Um, So she does understand what Misty's been going through. She understands the pressure that Misty's been under because she was under similar pressure in the past. Yeah, and I mean, even... I I love the moment where Colleen sort of backflips her to the the mat in the boxing ring. And and Misty's kind of, you know, again, she's she's playing it for the sympathy. You know, are you pleased that you took down a a one-armed cripple? And she's like, no, if that's how you view yourself, that's how you view yourself but she then goes you're not that you're you're the reason that i still have an arm you were selfless you jumped in and saved me um and she goes i'll never pity you so don't pity yourself and uh, really really interesting i mean this is just such a great great team up with these two ladies and both in the the boxing ring and when they go for the drink in in the bar Uh, i loved the the little skits in terms of learning the chi as well (laughs) where you just the look on misty's face as she she, you know she's trying not to laugh to crack a smile Mm -hmm. uh, and And then just does that chant that we would all do if somebody started talking to us about chi Um, (laughs) and about how hokey it all feels Mm -hmm. to her really really good um and i love the moment where colleen's like do you want a drink? And she goes, I've got plenty of water. And it's like, no, not that kind of drink. Yeah. And, and they we end up drink. in the bar uh, just chatting about what they would do if they won a million. And, <laughs> um, I just love the very different things. One is about libraries and books. And the other is I want to get a dirty Mustang that's got V8, all this kind of stuff. Not that I understand any of that, but, you know, yeah. really... Yeah. You've watched Top Gear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, like, it, it's got little horsey power, you yeah. know, it's got <laughs> cylinders, oh, right. oil you, and grease. You, um, need to, yeah. you need to stop there. No, I do, I do love this idea because, effectively, what Colleen has said, because she's so in touch with her chi side, she's in touch with that kind of chilled-out hippie side, if she wins a million dollars, she'd do something that she could do today for free. She'd go to a library where you don't pay for books and read the books. Like, that's hilarious. I love that that's that moment. It's not I'd buy a big mansion and set up a great library in it. I would go to a specific library where it's all free and read the books. It's, it's hilarious. And Misty is, yeah, dirty car, of course. That's a, that's absolutely the coolest thing. I'm wondering, is that a car that appeared in the Daughters of the Dragon uh, or in Hero for Hire comic books? I want to check that the specs that she gives and see if that's an actual car that's been a market. Marvel Comics at some point that Misty's been driving. Uh, I have a feeling it might be a reference. Probably. I do want to give a big hat tip to the costume designer in th- this episode mm-hmm. because having Colleen wearing the white, Missy wearing the red kind of burgundy kind of coloring yeah. is a direct nod to their classic color scheme yeah. and kind of outfits in the comics as the Daughters of the Dragon. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just had because you could have just had them wearing anything, mm-hmm. and it was just like, no, we'll do a nice nod for the Easter egg hunters, and yeah, that was brilliant. That's Stephanie Maslinski again, uh, who's been doing all the costumes for the Netflix Marvel shows. She's done just, just got a great eye for finding natural clothes that look like the comic book clothes, but not too close. It's not like they're not going to get costumes made uh, from a, an armory um, to clothe these two. This is something that they could just pull out of their closet and it looks like the front cover of, of Heroes for Hire book or something like that. You're, you're absolutely yeah. right. Really good call, Chris. I, I want to bring in just the, the bar fight mm-hmm. with Morty. Yes. My God, Morty and his <laughs> shallow swimming chat-up lines, uh-huh. uh, which actually weren't chat-up lines because he just wanted to have a go at uh, poor old... 
Misty just for putting his brother away. Yeah, it's quite interesting, isn't it? I missed that the first time. I was <laughs> kind of going, why is she punching him again? Oh, yeah, okay, of course. It's because yeah. she put his brother away in, in, in prison. So once again, another little thing about putting the head above the parapet. You know, Luke Cage, we've talked about many times already this season about the fact that he's got the fame following him around the city. Misty, in another way, is around Harlem, and she's obviously arrested a lot of people in Harlem over her years working for the Harlem PD. She had left and is now back in the Harlem PD, so she's back around the area where she arrested a lot of criminals. So uh, there are going to be these moments when she goes out in public where she'll meet someone that's a relative of a person she put away, and it it's, can be pretty dangerous if you're not as kick-ass a fighter as uh, as Misty. I love how that fight plays out. I love that you have Colleen just sitting back with her beer in hand, watching the fight, and... yeah. And effectively, she doesn't step in until somebody tries to use a weapon, which is a broken glass bottle. She just sits back, watches Misty go at it. There's a great uh, attempted punch that she tries to throw with her missing right hand and then realizes, hang on a second, I can't do that anymore. And then just uses the left hooks all the way around the room, taking people out left, right and center. Really, really good choreography in that scene. Really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, I love the Western type thing where, you know, they, they walk out with that swagger and misty's like just put it on his tab mm-hmm. you know it's a real western yeah. vibe to it you know they've come in drinking they they've had the bar fight this time over a pool table and a dartboard rather than a stand-up piano and then it's like they they go out with everything in bits going mm-hmm. put it on his tab uh, i absolutely loved it it was even just the swapping of the the weapons mm-hmm. yeah they both used the eight ball just the fact that like they they toss it that that to me feels like what they were and it it gives you that flash again of the uh, the defenders where we had the two of them fighting obviously with Claire at that point as well mm-hmm. but majority of just the two of them and I know I made the joke about daughters of the dragon pilot no don't joke I don't joke I know no but that's the thing from seeing this. I'm okay with that. Oh, yeah. We can assume that they are not finished with the Marvel Netflix characters. Mm -hmm. We can assume that maybe the Into the Night guys will get their Moon Knight. Um, But before that, because you have two fantastically well-built, well-rounded characters, the next show I actually want is Daughters of the Dragon. Yeah, yeah. I want to see that. Just based on just this scene, well, this not scene, based on this episode, their their swagger. The chemistry. chemistry yeah. yes thank you yeah. i think we mentioned it back at defenders as well they really did have a good bit of chemistry back there yeah. when you saw them working together for the first time but now you really feel they're friends as i said that moment with colleen just kind of going um i'll treat you with respect always don't put yeah. yourself down it, oh and also again leaning up against the bar watching her fight when she has just told her that she doesn't feel strong enough anymore but colleen knows she is and she won't isn't willing to step in unless her life's in danger it just seemed, just seemed like a really good pairing of these two characters and absolutely want to see uh, more of them over e- even in, in their own series or at least in the rest of this show yeah i think we here on defenders tv podcast are absolutely pro daughters of the dragon series um and we certainly have loved seeing misty knight and colin wing uh connect up here mm-hmm. uh in in luke cage but okay these two are coming together but we see um a little bit of uh, a split uh happening in luke cage and i think this moves on to our bullet point four mm-hmm. uh luke and claire are not in great shape as this couple and in fact you know we see a, a split up here um yes. which is not something i was expecting you could really see the strain and the fracture um taking shape there in episode two yeah but um i didn't think it was going to end up like this but i think it comes back to again this just self-obsessed single-mindedness that luke has gotten himself into this kind of groove and whatever anyone says to him uh no matter how they say it he's not going to take it on board and, and ultimately his frustration uh lashes out at the plasterboard and um you get a fantastic um argument here i mean this is a really good argument it's really sad for the the characters in terms of that it ultimately ends up with claire asking luke to leave the apartment but the argument itself uh, again just so well written really nicely done 
uh, as to how it's being approached in this series. And I thought this was like just phenomenally um written acted uh, and just how it it fell right within the context of what they've done with luke cage season two so far yeah absolutely and i think it's quite interesting that we talked about their fight in episode two and i think chris and and myself both kind of said we're not on claire's side here we're on luke's side she shouldn't be forcing him to go back and and meet his father just because of what she's gone through in the past and in this episode it flips completely i can't see anything of Luke's point of view here. I do not understand his point of view, this idea of coming to Claire, who's gone through so much with him over the years and going, you don't understand what my life has been like. You don't understand real racism. Saying that to Claire, like she has gone through so much in her life. It's just incredible to start an argument like that, which is totally unwillable when you're talking to someone who's who had the same experience as you and slightly different experiences. I love Claire's description of her home life as a, as a kid where people in her own family hated other members of the family because of the color of their skin. Um, it's, it's a fascinating argument to have. And just to have Luke Cage going, you don't understand what my life is like when I walk into a lift. If there's a white woman in there, she's clutching her purse so that I don't steal it from her. That's what I look like. And Claire just kind of going, you don't need to have this argument with me. Don't justify your life and your actions by the outside impressions. I've had the similar, a similar life and I don't do this kind of stuff. It's so, so good. And as you say, John, that punch through the wall is one of the best moments I've seen because it is Luke choosing to punch the wall, not Claire. And she sees it instantly. She realizes that's how far his anger has gone now, that he is so frustrated that he could have punched her, but chose not to. And how do you ever apologize for that? How do you ever apologize and say, I I definitely won't do that again when the choices were either I punch the wall or you? It's a total abusive moment, which she's gone through, as she says, with her family in the past. Her father and mother were in that relationship where her mother forgave her father, obviously, once or twice and ended off getting abused by him. So she steps right away from it. A very quiet argument. It's a very tempered Claire Temple that we get here, where she very specifically says, this is over, you need to leave. Luke is almost in tears telling her, well, we'll just take a break and and maybe we'll both have a think about it and then we'll, we'll talk tomorrow. Claire's having none of it. She says, you need to get out of here now and we're done. And it's amazing to see. This was so tough to watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just so tough. Um I have a thing about abuse mm-hmm. in on TV. Um more just because I'm from a broken home and that type of thing mm-hmm. and I'm like seeing it kind of brings a lot of this stuff to reality. But also you also do get a lot of Hollywood dramatization of this stuff. Yeah. This doesn't feel like jump. This feels like oh our two friends, I'm, we're watching two of our friends, because we've seen their relationship blossom over, and okay, yes, they're fictional characters, but you kind of, that's what would happen in real life. Yeah. Okay, obviously not punching through a wall with superhuman strength, but you understand where I'm going with Yeah, this. but it's just plasterboard. I, I could probably punch through plasterboard. <laughs> yes, exactly. It took him three tries, though, right. by the way. I was like, oh, didn't really show that one off in the special effects. Yeah. But it's just a very tough scene, and I don't know. It's a shame that these guys would not win an Emmy or something like for this, because you can't get an Emmy for just one scene. Yeah. But if you could, you could. This would be amazing yeah. because this really shows they flip the hero to be the villain so quickly in the scene. And Derek, you and me said it. We were on Luke's side. Not just an episode, an hour before. Yeah. We were like, no, Claire's in the wrong here. Like, she should not be doing this. And then it's just, oh, no, no, I'm with Claire. Like, I'm team Claire. Go Claire. No man has that right. And as you said, he he made that choice. But the fact he thought about that choice for a second, he still has not registered this. As you hear from him, okay, let's talk tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, how big is his ego at this point the create the character's ego have they yeah. created to the point where you're like he still thinks he's in the right mm-hmm. yeah it's it's that moment isn't it where claire effectively doesn't answer him um when he says you know i wasn't going to hurt you and the hand just goes up to his cheek and i think you know it comes back to right at the start where effectively both of them do say that they love one another yeah uh, and that's what makes it even more 
crushing uh, I, I think in in that sense uh, as a viewer looking on the outside but you know you have Claire saying that this <laughs> is changing you you know that um you've always been raw but you've never been brutal like you were towards cockroach mm-hmm. I think for me this as, as you say Derek you know it, it's this idea that all, all of a sudden the the argument the conversation between the two of them goes on about who has the worst experience of of, of having prejudice against you in the form of racism mm-hmm. um and you know as you say it's not something that anyone should win um, or have an upper hand over if you've experienced that. But I, I think the the thing that I just found so phenomenal about this scene is that it becomes um, even more complex than, than that because it, you know, you can see the masculinity that Luke Cage has here. And that also is an issue in terms of understanding this. You know, he says that I can do one of two things. Um, I can be the chilled out dude on the corner or I can embrace the, the anger and, and be that person that everyone is clutching their hand back from. Um, and, you know, it, it's not just simply about prejudice to do with racism it's about to do with sex it's about to do with a whole host of ideas which i thought was phenomenally portrayed here Mm -hmm. and put across uh within the writing that was the the exceptional part about this uh for me was that it didn't just deal with flat out racism it was a dealing with a whole range of other things here. Yeah. And, and I do think it's important here that the conversation that's going on is really naturalistic. It doesn't feel like this is the episode where they talk about racism. As you say, this feels like Not the episode all. where they have an argument about things we haven't seen on screen. There has been no moment where Luke Cage is standing in his hoodie in a lift with an old woman looking at him thinking she's got, he's going to rob her. We haven't had that moment. It's not on the back of something that happened. These are unresolved issues with inside Luke, and he's taking them out in his partner, even though she has absolutely zero to do with it. And he's not accepting her position and her knowledge and her experience when she's saying, you need to calm down, Luke. You need to get this out of your system. You need to keep away from it. it it's so good. And, and I know you mentioned, Chris, that this feels really realistic. One of the things I said just after watching the episode was... It's really interesting. Most shows that have these type of fights, it's always on the back of them going out and having a few drinks. And then that's their get out clause in the next episode. They go, oh, I had a few drinks. I wasn't in control of myself. This is the two of them in the middle of the day, just getting angry at each other in an angry argument. Luke has no way out of this. Luke can't turn around to her and say, oh, I'm really sorry. I lost my mind there for five seconds. This is going to be very difficult for him to come back from. Yeah. If he can. It's it's that complexity of prejudice, uh, mm-hmm. and um, if I can just use an example from the latest series of RuPaul's Drag Race, actually, mm-hmm. where RuPaul um, talks about how he had had to deal with prejudice and he goes first of all it was from white men because he was black then it was from black people because he was gay within that community and then from gay people for being effectively uh, an effeminate uh, gay person and Mm -hmm. these different tiers uh, these different times in your life where you experience that and don't expect it, get over it, just the complexity and I think that's what is drawn out by Claire in this uh, and I have to say, I think Claire Temple has been so good in this uh, season of Luke Cage. I think in the past she's uh, maybe been accused of like turning up and, and putting on a plaster or a swab or, or something like that. Here, she really is getting to the heart of something that I think both showrunner, writer, director, ha- and I think all the directors and writers within the show have nuanced into a really effective scene talking about a really difficult subject uh, but not making it feel forced within um, the series so far we're still early on you know this is episode three of 13 episode season Mm -hmm. and so i have to say um i thought this was such a great piece of work uh ultimately no matter how tough it was to watch Mm -hmm. and that's exactly what i said to you guys as soon as I finished watching this episode, I went, oh, that was tough. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, I'm leaving my point at that. That was tough. Yes. The final bit I just want to ask, do we think that this is the end of the couple? And do we think that this potentially is the end of Claire 
in the ongoing Luke Cage side of the, the series. Do you know, I think it would be a great way for them to finish the arc of Claire Temple. What we've seen over all of her appearances is that she wanted to get closer and closer to the superheroes in New York. And I think this moment where she realizes, "Uh oh, I've put myself in a real place of danger now at home, which I said I'd never do. You know, it it feels like a strong way of finishing her storyline. I don't think they're going to finish it there. I do think we're going to see Claire back in the show. Um, I think there's a little bit of an out there with her going to visit Luke's father, him realizing at the end of their conversation that she mentions Luke rather than Lucas, which she started out with. So he realizes it's probably his son that she's talking about in the relationship. So I think it's possible that we'll have her going back to the father again and him maybe convincing her to give Luke one more shot. But I'm not sure. I don't know whether that takes away from Claire's strength in this moment to say, I said to myself, no matter how much I love someone, I'll never put myself in this situation of danger. So I'm not sure. So I think it's the end of the relationship. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's the end of her in this season. Right. I think she'll come back, heal him up or something. But then when he goes to try and kiss her, she says, no, I'm out. Mm -hmm. I told you that. And that will be the end of the Luke Cage, Claire Temple. Yeah. We'll continue to see her in other series. So she'll be in Jessica. She'll be in, I think, because they have made her, like, she needs to be back for Daredevil. Maybe. Um. I think I think that she they made her to they made her the Nick Fury mm-hmm. the Philip Coulson and sadly there is there was a moment eventually that uh, that Nick Fury stopped appearing in every single Marvel movie unfortunately and I think Rosario Dawson may have come to the end of her contract with Marvel Netflix so if they bring her back it might need to be for a bigger role um, than her appearing for a few episodes in, in various series. This is the biggest role she's had is within Luke Cage. We said yeah. her, her treatment in Luke Cage season one was fantastic. And I think it's better in these first three episodes. So I'm hoping we do see her back. But she was the third daughter of the dragon. Mm-hmm. So she was the trio to Misty and Colleen. Yeah. yeah. And I think we, with her little tiger claws. Yes. If we saw it. Like that, that <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't remember. Not with her tiger claws. I meant with the weapon that looked like claws. Yeah. Um, so I think that's potentially where she will become her own night nurse character. Like she becomes the essential point character. She's not a secondary, just in for a couple of episodes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. John, what do you think? I, I'm with you actually, Chris. I, I definitely think that, you know, here, uh, I don't see a way back for Luke and Claire. Mm-hmm. Um, I really don't. I think that certainly is evident from when she said i promised myself i would never get into this situation and lo and behold she has um found herself in that situation so i i I think it would be really difficult and i i think if anything it would have to be done slowly if it was to happen at all Mm. Uh, and i don't think we will see it in season two of luke cage uh, at the very least she will still um, maybe heal him up or, or care for him because I think you still get that sense that, you know, this is like a tragic split, uh, that's happening. They both care for one another, but it's just gone and gotten way out of hand. Um, and I really hope that having seen how she's been treated as a character in, in Luke Cage in terms of the quality of their writing around the part, which I think it's not to say in the other um, Marvel Netflix shows where she's appeared that she's had terrible uh, writing or anything like that associated with it. It's just more that this just feels more integral as a meaningful relationship rather than simply showing up effectively like her first moment with Matt Murdock in season one of Daredevil. Mm. That made sense. Uh, and then unfortunately, um, she, she fulfilled a role to bring the defenders together. And I, but I think really in Luke Cage, she's had some really good writing, yeah. uh, that really shows that character. And I'd love to see her as uh, a third member of the Daughters of the Dragon, like you say, Chris, for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah, I'd ho- I hope we're going to see her interact with Misty again, perhaps, or, or Misty and Colleen uh, later on in the season as well. It'd be really cool. Yeah, we could definitely talk about this point for an entire podcast because it is probably the best moment we've seen of drama anyway uh, that we've seen on screen. Yes. So let's go on to a bit of a funner 
a more fun moment. Well, I was going to say, speaking of pain, bullet point <laughs> five, um, Bushmaster brings the physical pain mm. here, for sure. Yeah, yeah. But before the final scene of the episode, we do get a big warehouse fight. We get a bit of a superhero fight. Uh, as we see Luke take on a whole gang of Yardies uh, when he goes down to Brooklyn to pay a visit to the Yardies' hometown or their backyard, as, as you said in your in your synopsis earlier on. It's a really interesting fight, isn't it? I, I watched it the first time, kind of going, this is a little bit slow for a fight. It seems to be a little slower than the way they do a Daredevil fight, for example, or an Iron Fist fight even. It seemed to cam- the camera or the movement seemed a bit slower. And then I realized when I watched it the second time that actually... This is a test of Luke's powers. It's not about 20 people coming in and attacking him at the same time and him fending all of them off. This looks like Bushmaster is going, okay, right, number two, right, let's see what happens when you hit him over the head with a, with a crowbar. Uh, number three, right, you need to throw a yeah. grenade at him uh, and see what happens when he catches a grenade. Um, it's a great fight. There's some great movements within it, but it just feels like it's totally set up as a test rather than a battle. It was like a gladiatorial battle where, you know, as some becomes the the hero of the the Colosseum, the the challenge becomes bigger right. and greater for him to prove his worth. And and here you see that uh, Bushmaster's right hand man is filming uh, the whole fight on, on, on a mobile, mm-hmm. and you see Bushmaster himself not getting involved, but just kind of looking and analyzing. Yeah. And you get that great moment where he's in that spiritual circle of, of candles with the, the different roots and, and herbs burning, uh, as he's looking at that footage of Luke, uh, and, and his fight. Uh, and he's doing a load of moves. It, it's like he's finding the move that will ultimately lead to a takedown of, of Luke Cage, which, uh, was really, really cool. I really enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think they're kind of building Bushmaster up to be this. Um, do you remember there's a character called Karnak from the Inhuman comics and as well as the, the, the TV show, which we shall not mention? I definitely didn't think we'd be talking about Inhumans at all, uh, ever, on this show. <laughs> yes, but uh, we strangely did because kind of he was a martial artist, but he could find the weak spot in any uh, character. Bushmaster is constantly kind of coming and he's just evolving his style. So yes, he is making himself more powerful because he is inhaling more of that nightshade. But when you say like he's watching it and then all of a sudden the way the camera pans to the TV and him, you could see that he was, he was weaving outside. If you line it up, he's weaving outside of Luke's punches and stuff. So it looks like, okay, he's testing Luke's powers to know, as you said, what's the one that's going to do it. By the way, that grenade scene, oh, yeah, so good. Just the holding it in the hands. I was hoping like they blow the hands apart or something, but just showing he how powerful yeah. he's becoming that it's just the grain falling out. I really enjoyed this progression of the Yardies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. me too. We did get confirmation that Shades and Bushmaster do not know each other. Yes, yeah. That, yes, that's we true, got confirmation yeah. on this. He says he, he's just an aggressive new leader, a very aggressive Jamaican guy is now the new leader of the Yardies, that's right. Yeah. Uh, there is also that great moment within that fight where we see another, I think, newer power of uh, of Luke Cage, where he gets shot at by guns. Once again, somebody uses a gun on him, but I think that's just, again, part of the test that Bushmaster's has heard so many times this guy is a bulletproof. Well, we might as well try some guns on him and see what happens. But what we see is Luke bouncing bullets back to, again... <laughs> to kill one of the guys that shot at him, or at least injure one of the guys that shot at him. He falls to the ground, doesn't he? And he's, he's hurt. But we see him bouncing bullets back off his body and directing them at somebody. I don't yeah. know whether he's just learned to do that better. He's obviously, doing that shoulder thing. Yeah. Uh, like one of those yeah. great memes, uh, the one with the cat and, and the dude, where they yeah. go, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was very much a Terry Crews, I'm going to bounce my abs at you. Nice. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. come on. <laughs> yeah it was really it was really cool yeah, i really, really like that moment but it does seem like i know it obviously bullets have always bounced off him but it just feels like a new power that he's been able to now direct the bullets back at the person that shot at him i just think that's really cool <laughs> yeah i also really enjoyed the the lead up to this fight as well i really liked bushmaster and luke cage kind of just sussing one another out and mm-hmm. um, because right at the start of this episode as bushmaster is getting out of bed after having two cups of coffee uh he <laughs> You know, he he says to his advisor, you know, his right-hand man, he says, 
This Luke Cage vexes me. He feels that he's working for Mariah and then finds out that he's not. And, you know, there's this ele- element of my enemy of my enemy is my friend. You know, will Luke Cage work with him? And of course, Luke absolutely won't. And um, you get this sense of, you know, Bushmasters, uh, that Harlem is his birthright. And, you know, this comes to haunt Luke Cage uh, right at the end of this episode where he's knocked to the pavement and you have Bushmaster just looking over him going, you know, this is my yard. Mm-hmm. Um, really, really cool. You know, in terms of this idea of Harlem being his birthright, I love the fact that, you know, this this 20-odd million that he's given to Shades um, with the head of poor old Nigel in the uh, who apparently lacked vision, which, <laughs> of course, you would if you've had a knife effectively scrolled across your, your eyes and the bridge of your nose. He talks about he's wanting to fatten Mariah um, Stokes up before uh, she's slaughtered. And again, he corrects Luke saying, Stokes, you mean Mariah Stokes. That's right. Doesn't uh, Shades actually say that it's not 20 million, it's vastly above the 20 yeah. million? that they were looking for so he's he doesn't give a crap about money he wants to give um some confidence to mariah so he can take her down from an even higher height yeah and the really interesting thing is is that when bushmaster is going through that ceremony that great little transition um from his face into mariah dillard's was really really cool i'm kind of going is this supposed to mean more than simply a transition is it just that connection between bushmaster's family and whatever the stokes family had done to his family or or community at some point in the past or is it a more personal connection and i'm wondering was there a was there a merge of another face in the that he is channeling? Because I thought before it went from Bushmaster into Mariah Dillard's face that there was this kind of um, fading in of another image of someone else. Maybe where he's getting his spiritual, mystical power mm. from, from these ceremonies that he's doing. And I thought that was... that just was really cool this channeling of a a, a different power or spirit uh, that gets kind of faded into his face there uh, in in the shot and i think it's probably because it's such a spiritual kind of scene because the way it's filmed again i mentioned it before but it does really feel like that moment with stick and stone back in in uh, in daredevil season one it felt like that really spiritual place where he's surrounded by candles and because of the kind of fading in and out, I think it's Luke's face, actually, that he's seen because he's been focused on training to get Luke. And he's also been focused on taking down Mariah, the head and the heart of Harlem. Uh, he's been focused on taking both of them down. So I think that's what it's supposed to be representing. But I know what you mean. It does feel like, is there something more here? Is he getting inside their actual heads? Is he is he transferring his essence into the two of them? Or is he sending a vision of himself to the two of them as their main enemy? It's gonna, it's a, it's, But it's a really cool scene. It's, it's really interesting. Didn't he say a line in one of these episodes, known line enemy? Yeah, so I think that's kind of... Potentially where what we're getting, which is he's getting into the mindset of he's trying to get into the mind of Luke. He's trying to get into the mind of Mariah. Yeah. And that's where he will find their weakness. Exactly. Exactly. But I, I do like how this is playing out with, with Bushmaster and Luke, this idea of they keep mentioning this word yard. What they haven't really mentioned is these are two dogs in the same yard trying to own it. And once you have two alpha male dogs walking into the same yard at the same time they're gonna fight and they are gonna attack each other until one is dominant well it's two bulls in a pen yeah is is the term that bushmaster uses Mm -hmm. uh there's not enough space for the two of them exactly exactly so no matter what even if there was no mariah in here if these two just crossed paths at some point they were gonna fight it out so it's, it's cool to see the start of that right here at the end of the episode Yes, uh, boys, with that, I think it's time we wrap up our points. Yes, yes. Uh, Does anyone have any notes? Just one quick note, uh, because I had to look it up since I didn't know what the reference was to, but doing an Eric Benet, we hear uh, we hear Bobby Fish uh, saying to Luke, did you do an Eric Benet? Uh, Eric Benet is the former husband of Halle Berry, and uh, Jay-Z coined this term for uh, doing an Eric Benet, which effectively is when you leave the most beautiful woman in the world for somebody else. It's called doing an Eric Benet. So, so Bobby Fish is effectively saying, Claire is the most perfect woman in the world. 
did you screw this up like Eric Benet did? Um, which is a nice little a nice little inside gag between the two of them. And again, musical reference. So I'm sure Chio Coker loved that uh, that little touch. Uh, I really enjoyed the Usain Bolt references that Luke Cage kept <laughs> being challenged on first by the guys in, in the, the the corner cafe mm-hmm. and restaurant, and then obviously by Bushmaster himself. You know, Luke Cage. You said you were faster than Usain Bolt, and he's like, "I never said that." I like that little thread, and it, feel, uh, and it really did feel like those old guys in the in the uh, restaurant were not going to help him because he challenged their Usain Bolt. Yeah, They're often exactly. Jamaica Usain Bolt being the fastest runner from Jamaica. It's a it's a nice touch that it feels like. Hang on a second, you have completely offended the entire country of Jamaica by doing something. That, or by saying something that you actually didn't say, by just even being faster than Usain Bolt, that's offended the entire country of Jamaica. I love it. Love it. Uh, final note for myself, Piranha, Raymond Jones, my namesake. He is actually a comic book character from Power Man. Um, first appeared in issue 30 in 1976. Wow. But he is nowhere respectable and essentially is just this thug with sharpened knife-like teeth. Wow. Like Piranha's. There you go. Interesting, interesting. Although I really like him to see in this take out his dentures and just have all those kind of prana teeth. I do not think it will happen. But <laughs> yeah. Anyway, a boy can dream. Good stuff. But that's all my notes. Good stuff. I guess since we're finished our notes and our points, it's on to our defense. Let's do this uh, quick one, guys, because we've got some feedback that we need to get into uh, after our defense. Uh, John, do you defend this episode of Luke Cage, episode three, Wig Out? I do defend this episode of Luke Cage. I give it four and a half Nigel heads out of five. (laughs) I just absolutely found this a really good episode. Really, really good, in fact. Um, It it challenged me as an audience member. I think it challenged the central protagonist of this entire series, Luke Cage. Um, It showed this different side the treatment of, of Luke Cage as sinking into similar areas as the people he's trying to fight against. I love just the, the challenge of him from Misty and from, from Claire and ultimately, you know, really tough, uh, scene to see as, uh, Claire uh, and him effectively reach breaking point. I really enjoy seeing Colleen and Misty come together in the Daughters of the Dragon. Just so, so cool. Um, seeing these two uh, supporting one another and working things out. I like the fact that it's all sort of undercut with Misty really feeling challenged in work, really feeling insecure. Uh, really enjoyed that. Uh, and just how the, when you take on the advice of your friends, when you have those discussions, that if you maybe listen, take some of it on board, it can really, really help you. I love the fight scene between the two of them. That was so good. Again, Bushmaster, what um, an antagonist in, in this series so mm-hmm. far. I'm absolutely uh, adoring how um, this character has been put across and, and how confident he is, uh, both standing up to, to Luke Cage. And I love his his ticks his teeth sucking um i love the the constant no it's mariah stokes i mean just like again he is a man obsessed and then just mariah dillard and just seeing her being as bushmaster says fattened up for slaughter um i can see her world coming crashing down uh, very very quickly here i'm really intrigued to see uh how that is going to play out and um, especially since we've just seen her and shades with the crowns of harlem over their head so yeah really defend this episode of luke cage mm-hmm. christopher do you defend this episode of luke cage yes i 100% do it was tough to watch the the whole reason being that one scene mm-hmm making it very tough, changing potentially the whole fabric and character interactions of this series. I'm quite happy that they don't shy away from Mm -hmm. it. Um, Very often you would save this for a latter third of the series where you kind of break down the relationship just to build them up again. You don't do it on the third episode of a 13-episode series. It's unheard of. Um, Which is just what we get from Luke Cage from these Netflix shows. They don't prescribe to the usual formula they don't subscribe to anything so i'm very happy with how they're doing it i'm happy with where the things are going i'm interested to learn more i want to jump onto the fourth 
And yeah, let's just keep going. If they continue at this pace, if they continue at this storyline or a story beat, uh, I, this is in the running for the best Netflix show to date. What? If. <laughs> That is the, the big if. Ten more episodes to go, Chris. Exactly. So, ten more, and then I'll report back on where this falls into the ranking. Mm-hmm. But uh, that is mine, so yes, I do defend. Derek, do you defend this episode of Luke Cage? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hugely defend this episode. Like the headline for this episode really is, Colleen Wing returns. The Daughters of the Dragon have their first big fight scene just together, side by side. And where this episode lives is in the small moment, the domestic argument between claire and luke cage it sits right there this is the moment that should be remembered from this episode because it's so beautifully played so beautifully put together but there's other great moments within within the episode but that totally overshone everything else because it's it feels like something really really real the netflix shows always have said we deal in realism we deal in the the street level end of the marvel universe but they never really have achieved that moment which feels like absolute realism like this scene did so for that reason alone i'd defend it but also for all the other great moments that we've talked about throughout this with bushmaster with colin wing with misty knight all of those moments with obviously mariah um they're all fantastic and they surround the central piece which is a quiet angry argument in an apartment that could be in any other show, but not done as well as this. Really, really defend this episode. Really good. Excellent. Gentlemen, thank you so much. I think it's time for some feedback. Yes, it's my favourite part, because obviously we've been recording ahead of the episodes coming out on Netflix, and now we have responses from our wonderful fellow defenders about what they've been thinking about the episode so far. First up, we've got Ryan with a voicemail, which he left through our website over at DefendersTVPodcast.com. You can do that, or you can just record an MP3 through your voice recorder on your phone and email it to us at feedback at DefendersTVPodcast.com. But here's Ryan with his thoughts on episode one of season two of Luke Cage. Hey guys, it's Ryan here with my review of Luke Cage, Season 2, Episode 1. First off, I'm loving the way that they make the residents of Harlem a blatant character of this series, which again was pushed in Season 1 and they're pushing it straight away, Episode 1 of Season 2, so I'm loving that. I'm not loving so much the relationship of Shades and Mariah. I I think it's weird, but... I'm not going to say nothing because one, they don't care. And two, I like my life. Um, But it's good to see a lot of the characters back again that obviously uh, were in season one and didn't get killed off. So that's good. Uh, I, the Yardies, you asked for feedback on the accent. Uh, I'm half Jamaican myself, so I know what Yardies sound like. Those guys are not Jamaican, but they do a okay accent. Just like yourselves, you noticed uh, in Daredevil when the Irish, uh, the actors playing Irish um, people, their accents dropped off. You noticed that. So I noticed that when their accents dropped off a little bit from uh, being Jamaican Yardie accents. But apart from that, it's not bad. So we've got good, a couple of good uh, baddies that are going to come up in, in the coming episodes. But yeah, so far, so good. I'm enjoying it. So you'll hear from me soon. But thanks a lot, guys. See you later. Bye-bye. Ryan, thank you so much for that feedback. Uh, really appreciate it. And thank you for clearing up that accent piece. Yeah. Oh, my God. Great to know that it's not just... It was just not my craziness, my imagination. Thank you for telling us exactly that part. Of it. And thank you for that feedback. Yeah, and I definitely think Mariah and Shade's... Uh relationship all gives us a little bit of uh, night terrors i think for mm-hmm. sure and as you say yeah don't criticize it if they're around because they will <laughs> take it <laughs> uh, thanks so much for that yeah I, I suppose a really good point about the about the accents as, as you mentioned we definitely noticed that in daredevil season two where they had the the guys speaking irish and it sounded so bad um but I'm glad to know that they're getting the Jamaican a little bit better. We know now that the that the actors aren't Jamaican, that they're American guys. Um, so it is really interesting hearing your thoughts on that. It's, it's great to know that somebody that hears the Jamaican accent quite often would be able to pick out that they're not really speaking Jamaican, but doing a reasonably good approximation of it. So thanks so much for that, Ryan. That's really cool. Ryan also left us some feedback for episode two. Hey, guys, Ryan here. Just finished watching episode two. I'm liking the relationships of, uh, that are developing so far in this season. We've got Luke and Claire, and Claire forcing Luke to deal with his dad and the issues that he has, and how that will push that, their relationship. Uh, let's see what happens in that space. You never know. 
are they pushing for those two to break up and Jessica and Luke to get together again? Let's see. Uh, we've got Shades and Mariah. Shades has shown how he is willing to shoot someone at point blank over a couple of comments that are made. So let's see what happens there. We have Mariah and her daughter, that relationship. Uh, you know, Mariah's coming back into uh, her daughter's life. Let's see how that goes. Uh, we have Misty Knight and her relationship, I suppose, with her career, her badge, you know, uh, how she's dealing with that and how her colleagues are dealing with her, which I think some of the comments that were made <laughs> were a bit out of order, if you ask me. Um, I didn't think the banter levels could be there quite so soon. She's only been back a couple of days, but, you know, <laughs> um, yeah, but so far so good. I'm enjoying it. And uh, let's bring it on. Let's bring it on. Oh, just another thing, guys, for the accents. Uh, Bushmaster, when he came into the shop, he said to Mariah's daughter, give me what me want and let me go on, which means give me what I want and I'll be gone. So just to clear that up, guys. All right. Take care, guys. See you soon. Thanks so much for that, Ryan. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely getting a, a very interesting. There are lots of relationship problems and, and issues going on uh, throughout this. Now that we've seen episode three, we can probably see that they are breaking up Claire and Luke, as we've mentioned throughout this episode. Is it to push him towards going with Jessica? Will he go back to Jessica after uh, after everything that happened within her series and within the Defenders? We did see that they kind of mended their relationship and he did ask her to go for coffee sometimes. So maybe we might see uh, Luke going back to her. But I, th I think he'll be a little bit gun shy for a while um, after this relationship with Claire breaks up. So it may not be something we see at all within Luke Cage season two. It may be something that we'll, we'll wait until a future series to see yeah and totally agree with you ryan that yeah the banter around misty was a little too soon um as well in the workplace um i'm surprised she didn't hurl like a stapler or a <laughs> hole punch at them to be honest see, if she um, was at her own desk she'd probably have a few weapons to throw at people but she took somebody <laughs> else's desk so uh, maybe she didn't know where the where the things to throw were, were sitting <laughs> and thanks again as well for telling us uh what Guan means, I suppose, in that conversation that Bushmaster has with Tilda. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's really, it, it's good to know those different bits of, of dialect that he's speaking. Yeah. Yes, right. And I have a request going forward. You have a role as now a fellow defender. Anytime we see that uh, any of the Yardies or Bushmaster says any kind of colloquialisms, please just send us in a quick dictionary update going do you know what he meant right here <laughs> that is your role for the next 10 episodes i think that's a lot of work putting on ryan there chris <laughs> what i did notice in this episode though um we were talking about the the subtitles that have been uh, that were on the episodes when we got the previews for the first two episodes they were actually translated subtitles um so the the subtitles weren't the jamaican written in in english underneath it was actually translating the words into uh, what somebody else would say if they were from the u.s for example in this episode, weirdly, every time Bushmaster was speaking, they didn't translate it. It was actually the Jamaican written underneath. So it didn't provide any help to me <laughs> and when I didn't yeah. understand a word. It was just written exactly the way he said it, which I can hear. So um, so I didn't really need the subtitles this time or couldn't really use the subtitles this time. Yeah, thank you so much, Ryan, for the voicemail. It's really, really good. Um, moving on to our Facebook feedback as well. Remember, you can head on over to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Defenders TV podcast. Join the group and there are the spoiler posts where you can discuss everything about each episode of Luke Cage. And we've had a few in now for the first three episodes. For episode one, uh, Ronaldo says, I like how they are laying the seeds for Luke needing money, mm. hoping for heroes for hire to arise out of the financial funk soon. Bushmaster looks cool. Last time I saw cool Jamaican villains was in Predator 2. <laughs> also, Judas Bullet, what the... <laughs> love it. Uh, and he rounds it out with Cage is back at being indestructible. Absolutely. No more Judases to worry about stabbing him or blowing him up from the inside out. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Nice reminder of Predator 2 there, uh, Ray. I, I hadn't <laughs> thought about that film for a very, very long time. Yeah, I've tried to blank it out, actually. <laughs> Our next piece of feedback came in from Robert Phillips. He says, The music again is a brilliant character in this show. I feared it would go with the king and queen ruling and wanting a different flavor. I'm delighted that they didn't go that way. Yeah, absolutely love the music. The uh, soundtrack has already been confirmed this weekend. The soundtrack has already been confirmed to be getting the special edition Mondo vinyl treatment that 
every one of the shows has eventually had. They usually get announced about a month and a half or so after these shows come out. But the opening weekend, the weekend it's it's out on Netflix, they've already announced that the collector's edition of the soundtrack is coming. That's how much and how important the music is to the show. Yes, Jamie Rung wrote in to say, Bushmaster slicing through that guy's eyes was shocking. Doug Green replied to Jamie saying, my wife yelled gross when that happened. I got serious Westworld vibes. <laughs> I think we all did. Or as uh, our my fellow host said, Jordy LaForge vibes. <laughs> um, so take that which you will. Either Star Trek was seriously gross and we actually just remember it completely differently. Or, um, yeah, no, it was gross. And I'm kind of with Jamie and Doug on this. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, me too. It was totally gross, but it's just kind of, it smacked of Georgie LaForge, uh, kind of visor. And just to say, John's speaking for himself here, not for a defender of the podcast. That never crossed my mind. <laughs> it's my yes. weird mind. It's my weird mind. But one mind I do connect with is Alex, who says, I had a huge smile when Claire called Luke Power Man. Me too. Oh yeah. Me too, Alex. That might be the only point where our minds connect. I'm sure you didn't think Geordi LaForge either. <laughs> On episode two feedback, uh, Ray came back and said, you know you're fully domesticated when you're watching Luke Cage and you're wondering what furniture deals you could score from King Arthur Furnitures. <laughs> <laughs> he says the live music in this episode is fully sick, right in my wheelhouse. Gary Clark Jr. has got a classic vocal timbre and his guitar playing is effortless. Love it. Yeah, once again, that's probably one of my favourite uh, tunes, uh, the Gary Clark Jr. songs that he Big plays time. in that episode. I love a good blues musician. Part of the reason why we have all of the music for our shows is our blues musician mate mississippi mcdonald who is a great blues player has introduced me to some great blues musicians as well and um, that's part of the reason why we have the music we have for our shows because this is absolutely in our wheelhouse as well we love that type of music yeah robert phillips says on episode two so the season is going to be about family then is it different families and approaches i'm guessing the family of police as well as the families of cockroach luke slash carl Claire and the Royal Stokes mm. will feature. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, nice call out about the family of police. I don't think we mentioned that. We did say about the families and the relationships. We didn't really speak about the family of police. Oh, we, no, John did. Okay. Yeah. I should have remembered that. <laughs> Thanks so much for that feedback, Robert. Yes, moving on to episode three. Jamie Young said, so many complicated relationships this season. Shades and Mariah, Tilda and Mariah, Luke and Claire, Luke and his father. It's interesting to see a normally docile Luke angry and violent. I love that Bushmaster is a threat to both Luke and Mariah. He's so intriguing. I want to know more about him. And I know we already saw the part of Colleen and Missy Barbrawl in the promotional clips, but OMG, how kick-ass is this scene? Daughters of Dragon for the win. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Jamie. 100% with you, although I didn't see it in the promotional clip so you know I'm, I, I my eyes were virgin I was untouched by marketing and it was just as good <laughs> it was it was so good really really enjoyed seeing the scene and, and loved seeing the other scene with the two of them early on in the episode as well not just the bar fight the actual relationship moment between Colleen and Misty showing how close the two of them are yeah absolutely Jamie so, uh, some really good points there uh, Kale Hensley he actually has uh, an easter egg here or should I say a munchkin box um, he goes I don't know if anyone here plays munchkin but there's definitely a super munchkin box laying next to the cockroach at the beginning of this episode when he's in the hospital bed um i don't play munchkin i'm not too sure i know what that means but for you munchkin people out there there is a munchkin box a <laughs> super munchkin box in fact so i spot kale so munchkin is a card game it's uh it's similar to like a dungeons and dragons type of type oh, of thing so um so really cool apparently i haven't played it myself either but uh, a nice catch kale well caught and our final piece of feedback is from Robert Phillips loves so many things about this episode the complicated relationships the grenade the bar scene and the Iron Man sending Satan away music at the end has Carl's dad actually changed he might have yes thank you so much Rob and yeah the complicated relationships the grenade the bar scene I loved all that I'm not sure where you're going with the Iron Man sending Satan away music at the end uh, that, that is a, that's one for me I'm a bit like Okay. Uh... That's like a munchkin box for me. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, the song exactly. at the end of the episode, guys. You've got to go back and watch episode three. That's the yeah, nice definitely. Time. Yeah. It's just the music uh... at the end of the episode. I don't think it's, I don't think it's Tony Stark, uh, if you're thinking That's that. That's literally <laughs> where my head was. It's like, did I miss Absolutely. a photo of in the background of like Iron Man fighting Satan? That would have been amazing. 
Just or it's the, Tony Stark and the dotting, guitar fighting Satan. Yeah. Exactly. Imagine <laughs> if they start dotting these really obscure imagery in the back of posters, <laughs> where you just see like the Hulk battling Jesus. <laughs> It'd be amazing. Interesting. Interesting. Why would the Hulk be? Anyway, <laughs> a really interesting point there, Robert. Has Carl's dad actually changed? I still have that feeling that Carl's dad. Uh, James is similar to Mariah as well. He likes to project a certain view of himself to other people, especially being a minister. Uh, in his sermons, he, pre- he presents a certain view. We saw him early on in the season uh, doing this to a mirror so that he gets the tomba right of his sermons that he's giving to people so people will see him a certain way. I'm not sure whether he's changed because I don't know whether we've seen his real face other than that moment when he talked to Luke in the street because nobody else was around and you saw how disrespectful he is of Luke and how much he commands respect from Luke. So I'm not sure if he's changed much or whether he's just really good at hiding it behind his mask when he's talking to Claire, for example, uh, in this episode. But really good point, Robert. Yes, so that's all our feedback for this episode. And you can get us over on Twitter and you can give us your feedback at DefendersCast or why not? Jump over to our group and could join in on all our conversations on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Defenders TV podcast. Mm-hmm. And of course, as I said, you can leave your voicemail for us over at DefendersTVPodcast.com or email us with any of your thoughts about any of the episodes to feedback at DefendersTVPodcast.com. If you're talking about an episode that we haven't covered yet, just make sure you mark the episode number of the episode that you're talking about. But we want to hear all of your thoughts uh, about the rest of the season. And thanks so much for joining us for this episode. Yeah, and remember to head on over to DefendersTVPodcast.com to subscribe, rate us, review us, um, and share your thoughts uh, with us we'll be back with our review of luke cage season two episode four i get physical on friday and just to let you know as a reminder we're moving back to our usual schedules of tuesday and fridays each week from now on so just every tuesday every friday make sure you're subscribed and get a notification when we launch our podcast gentlemen on that note i think it's time we leave but i just want to leave our fellow defenders with this one thought this episode is called wig out Every time we read it, I, all I can hear is wake out, and now I see the episode is I get physical, and all I have in my head is I get physical, physical, <laughs> with those terrible songs in our fellow defenders' head. My name is Chris Jones. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll be back very soon. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll talk to you next time on Friday. Yeah, as always, thank you so much, fellow defenders, for uh, listening with us, and we'll be back again to speak with you next time. Bye. You think I'm holding back? Thank you.